Hi everybody. I think we have a uh, pretty good, pretty good attendance out there as of now. It's 12 o'clock. We're going to get this thing uh, kick-started. Um, welcome everyone to the third installment of Ritu's pandemic webinar series. Not sure if that's the, the technical name for it, but that's what I'm calling it. Uh, today we'll be presenting information on the leading edge survey technologies and their potential applications in the energy market. I see there's many familiar names in attendance today, but for those that don't know me, my name is BJ Batterson. I'm the upstream oil and gas market lead here at Ritu. Ritu, I manage client accounts in upstream and midstream oil and gas and manage projects across other, other traditional markets as well. In all markets, it seems to be more frequent that you need a unique solution to a survey or data management problem. Uh, the presenters today work under the survey service area banner, but they're truly all around tech wizards. Um, That's why we thought it would be very useful to allow them to assist you in learning a bit more about the available technology and solutions for upcoming projects you may have. So first off, we'll have Bruce McFarlane. He's tech technology manager here at Ritu. Um, he's got close to uh, 20 years of experience working with various computer technologies and developing cutting edge techniques for solving unique challenges. He's responsible for implementing emerging, emerging technologies and creating custom solutions for clients across all markets. His professional resume includes enterprise technology infrastructure management, high definition scanning, and as a drone pilot, conducting surveys to collect critical data for various project types. And then we'll have Brian Freed, um, who's also a technology manager here at Ritu. He has 20 years of experience with surveying and engineering, software development, and spatial database design. Prior to joining Ritu, he designed databases and applications for utility pole surveys, including backends for utility companies' web portals, and He, he now has responsibilities in the uh, Ritu's midstream pipeline database, QGIS plugin, and survey web applications. He has extensive experience with uh, photogrammetry, 3D scanning and modeling, and he's also a drone pilot. So at this time, I'll, um, I'll kick it over to, uh, to Bruce. Thanks, BJ. Uh, good afternoon. I'm very excited to be here with you all to uh, talk about survey technologies and give you a foundational understanding of some of the ways they can be used to help the energy market projects and data capture and management. So today we'll be discussing a few key technologies and techniques to capture key data, as well as approaches to managing that information to aid in efficient project goal completion. Some of the technologies we'll be going over are visual data, thermal data, GPS surveying, and geospatial point cloud data. Well, visual data looks like the low hanging fruit. It's extremely valuable in all aspects of a project. Something we've learned over the past two months is that minimizing site visits will be a priority moving forward, as well as the convenience of the technology that facilitates it. Visual data is a multi-dimensional resource that can be used in many ways to provide realistic perspectives of a project site. 360 degree panoramic photos provide a unique view of a project site. Being able to have a, a perspective that is easily manipulated to monitor points of interest without being physically in front of them is quick, efficient, and easily accessed remotely. Terrestrial 360 degree panos can be taken with consumer grade specialized, specialized cameras, in which it will internally stitch together two or more photos from multiple lenses. Aerial panoramics, however, can be taken via drone by a licensed pilot and will essentially hover at a specific point and take a series of photos that overlap a full 360 degrees within its line of sight to be either internally processed or through specialized software. Having the ability to view these panoramic photos remotely can give confidence in project decision making without the time and overhead costs of frequent site visits. So while static photo and video capture is among the most traditional, current technology, however, allows us to capture the same data much more efficiently and in a much safer fashion. While anyone can feasibly use a digital camera to zoom in on a point of interest, using drones, we're able to control unsafe and inefficient situations, such as needing eyes on for a point of interest 
that isn't easily accessible and might be at a, diff a difficult angle. So let's take a look at some examples of visual documentation. Static photos are helpful. They really are. You know, they're, they're probably the most common form of, of visual documentation used for the last 50 years. But as we progress with technology, we can see so much more in a much more organized manner. Taking an industrial facility as a case study here, with possible renovations, expansions or repair scenarios in mind, it's quite helpful and efficient to be able to create a virtual tour with the intention of clicking on these areas of interest within the site and having full 360 degree views. Let's say there's some detail on the conditions of a valve or a pipe at a specific area of the facility. Having the ability to go to that particular spot and viewing the object makes decision making much more efficient and accurate. So let's build a quick scenario where this might be useful. In this photo, you can see the top of a centrifuge that, we've, that we hypothetically need to take out of this facility in order to rehab it. In order to do that, we'll need to find collision points along the way that might hinder getting it to the nearest exit point. Because we have the ability to, to have these immersive points of view, being able to make initial assessments on the valve, conduit, and piping connections that are in this path allows us to build a team of essential personnel to address these obstacles and plan accordingly as well as having reliable visual data that's often able to be accessed via web-based formats like you see here without the need for frequent site visits and coordination. So as you can see here, we're able to take a look at everything that's in the way of, of our particular path that we might be taking here. Having a full range of, of, of view here to, to look at possible connections, um, things that might not come up in static photos or video. Um, you know, it really gives you the ability to coordinate a plan of attack um, and really cover all the grounds possible um, so you don't miss any critical details. Similar to industrial 360 degree panel examples, aerial panels like this one right here can prove very useful in marketing, status updates, and documentation for record keeping. Do you have investors that want a project uh, project update and eyes on for a specific project site? Are there specific areas on the project site that you want to keep an eye on for condition assessment documentation? Autonomous drone flights and functions have really revolutionized how we view the tools available for a project site. Along with aerial panoramics are the ability to create project site time lapses like the one you see here in the top right. These aerial time lapses can be taken by flying a drone to a predetermined coordinate and taking a picture of the same spot weekly, monthly, or whatever the frequency is desired. These time lapses can give a great perspective as to project build status and makes for great marketing material as well. And lastly, seen in this video on the right here, while seemingly traditional, aerial video like this can be very useful. Drone flights can yield quite a bit of visual information for nearly every project site. This allows site documentation inspection to be conducted in a much more efficient manage, manner. A pipeline right-of-way inspection like this comes with its own set of logistical hurdles. To start, FAA regulations require a drone to be operated within visual line of sight. In addition to that, the minimum safe altitude that can be flown is just above the tree canopy, which in this example is right around 180 feet above ground level. These restrictions obviously pose a problem in not only getting close enough to the right-of-way surface to get the detail needed, but also a need to fly high enough to avoid trees and have the drone be visible at all times. With these hurdles in mind, a specialized drone with high definition zoom capabilities can be pre-programmed to fly at a safe altitude in the route based on the right of way center line. Now thermal imaging, often called FLIR imaging, is truly the next evolution in visual data collection. Allowing the naturally unseen thermal characteristics of objects to be viewed, radiometric imaging can provide a very insightful information. So what is FLIR thermal imaging? Radio Im radiometric thermal imaging measures the, the temperature of a surface by capturing the intensity of an infrared signal and is subsequently uh, processed by an internal camera sensor for that particular light spectrum. Since everything gives off a thermal signature, 
FLIR is a technology that, while seemingly very niche, can give insight into environmental characteristics that aren't easily seen with the naked eye. From solar to industrial facility and even MEP inspections, thermal imaging is a very valuable tool to have. Combining a thermal imaging camera with a drone increases capabilities further by allowing us to cover large areas in, a sh in short periods of time much quicker than on foot, as well as capturing accurate data to in hard to reach points of interest. Once the data is processed, reports and images can be delivered from FLIR equipment that enables viewing of radiometric data through client accessible software. So taking a look at a couple of thermal inspection examples, we can see that a seemingly innocuous photo of a solar array can yield quite a bit of data. While looking for thermal anomalies, we're able to see the difference in radiance between, uh, from broken or defective cells and panels within this array. Cross-referencing these defects with the projected output aids in predicting cost deficits due to the anomalies detected. Similar to the solar array, Industrial building inspections are another great example of how thermal cameras can be used to detect inefficiencies. Seen here in the landscape thermal photo, it seems closer to an abstract painting than a photo packed full of radiometric thermal data. However, what we can see is a building that has a consistent level of heat rating with colder spots indicating insulation and metal HVAC equipment. However, it is important to note that we can see there are possible uh, issues with insulation here or excessive heat emission from certain spots. These types of discoveries can be addressed with facility managers to reduce unnecessary HVAC overhead costs. Oops. So GPS surveying, while this seems a bit out of context among advanced technologies, GPS surveying is, is an, an efficient and important part of uh, data collection. Using GPS systems, conventional surveying provides a tried and true solution to when key data is needed in situations that might not be optimal for drones or scanning. GPS surveying yields highly accurate spatial data taken to aid in plotting out key points of interest on the ground. This data can also be, it can be taken with RTK or real-time kinematic GPS units, or in some cases triangulated using other survey equipment. So as we move forward into the realm of point clouds, I'd like to quickly go over the burning question of what is a point cloud? A point cloud is a data set that represents objects or space. These points maintain an X, Y, and Z coordinate in relation to each other. Large amounts of these data points are considered a cloud. So the two main ways to capture the, the data needed for a point cloud are through 3D LiDAR scanning and photogrammetry. The data that can be used for record keeping, conceptual design, um, precise management, uh, excuse me, precise measurements and spatial reference, terrain assessment, and volumetric monitoring. Drones collect data through geo-reference aerial photography, which reduces the time spent during collection. The level of detail attained through the images combined with processing software enables the ability to map and inventory uh, additional details on a project. Point clouds generated via drones use a technique called photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is the triangulation of data by taking points from at least two different lines of sight. The different lines of sight of a common object can develop three-dimensional coordinates that are mathematically calculated based off of that information. The resulting data set can be developed into a point cloud with accurate spatial data of the environment. The easiest way to demonstrate the concepts of photogrammetry it's by using equipment that every one of us have, your eyes. So imagine each eye is a separate camera. Individually, each eye can detect a relative distance to an object. So let's do a really quick experiment. Find an object in front of you, a pen or the corner of your laptop or monitor, close one eye and try to touch that object with your finger. It may not be terribly difficult, but more often than not, you're slower to touch that than if you have both eyes open. So now open both eyes and try to touch the same object. You should notice that it's much easier and it took much less concentration. This is the result of your brain triangulating the location of that object by using stereo imaging from both your eyes. This is also commonly referred to as depth perception. So now that we have a basic understanding of how photogrammetry works, let's take a look at a good example of what a drone flight can produce. As we see here, 
you can see a, a well pad and a service road connected to it. Using control points on the ground that are visible from the air, the accuracy of the drone data is tightened greatly. The drone is programmed to fly autonomously in grid patterns across the site in order to create multiple lines of sight of all objects in the area of interest. After ingesting that data into, into post-processing software, a point cloud is able to be generated as seen here. Now, as we take a closer look, you'll see that this is a true virtual interpretation of the site. The foliage and undulations of the terrain on the site is accurate in locations and dimensions. I jumped the gun. Now, high definition 3D LiDAR scanning uses a device that shines small lights at a surface and measures the time it takes to return to the source at a range at a rate ranging up to over 2 million points per second. These devices take a fraction of the time of conventional surveying relative to the size and conditions of the project and collects exhaustive information on the entire site or structure, eliminating the need for multiple site visits to compile more data. Using laser scanning allows for the creation of 3D of precise 3D models and increases the accuracy of as built documentation. Not only are drawings more detailed and exact, but the entirety of scan of the scan data is retained, enabling the ability to complete future drawings as needed without returning to the location. Let's look at a few examples to help you visualize what can be produced from scanning. So in our, our video here, you can see a 3D model of a compressor station. This 3D model was generated based on a scan point cloud. What's special about this particular model is that while the above ground features were captured via scanner, the below ground features were captured by subsurface utility locating equipment. Since above and below ground data was captured on the same coordinate system, a full 3D model was, be able, to, was able to be created from that data. This is a really great example of, of not only using multiple technologies to accomplish project goals, but from a planning perspective, the project data was predetermined to have specific points of interest desired. Despite the different logistical angles, the data was deemed necessary to be included in the deliverable. This allowed a specific plan of attack for above ground scanning, below ground utility location, and the control network that would be associated with in order to act as a connecting point for both of them. Through this approach, the client now has a very accurate model of the site, including dimensions of all above and below ground structures and utilities, as well as terrain contours for any future projects. In the lower left-hand corner here, you can see a really good view of a 3D model fly-through, which is on the left, and the point cloud data was built from, which is on the right. Now it's important to note here that the point cloud on the right is only about 10% of the amount of data points that are actually taken. So what you see is about 100 million points out of about a, a billion data points total, um, collected by, by a tripod mounted scanner over, it, over the course of 17 positions. What's important is, about this model is that you see on the left, it, it doesn't have nearly as much modeled as what's seemingly in the point cloud itself. This is because point clouds should be viewed as a, as a bank of information that can be mined for what is needed, which could be much less than what's present. So as we go through this, you saw just a second ago, you could probably make out some stairs and a platform, but that is not modeled in, in this particular model on the left side. Now, right here's a really good example of how modeling is based around what's needed and not necessarily what's exactly in the point cloud. In the point cloud on the right, you'll see quite a bit of information a lot of piping that you, you may be able to make out here, a lot of uh, miscellaneous, ob miscellaneous objects or structures um, to the right. It really gives you an idea for the fact that what's modeled here was particularly important for this project. So now going back to what we talked about earlier in those 360 panels with building out a, a collision path for a centrifuge to be um, taken to an exit point over here. Um, if you know, while the, the panels are great for visual documentation and coordination and making decisions based off of that, using a point cloud like this and modeling specifically what's needed here 
allows for, for spatial dimensions, very accurate spatial dimensions, um, and the ability to determine um, you know, distances between objects or, or what, may be, um, what may be in its path specifically at, at a, a specific height and um, you know, what modifications might need to be made based off of that with hard proven numbers um, for the mentality of you know, measure twice, cut once. Um, the beauty of all this is that as this project expands, um, you can easily go back later, mine more information out of it. This is not a one and done um, or a, a mission impossible. It's not going to blow up after you use it um, or anything like that. This is um, information that can be mined frequently um, as projects uh, evolve or um, as the need to go back to it um, arises. Now lastly, tripod mounted scanners are incredibly powerful and, cap and can capture data well up to 400 feet away. However, there are times in environments that need, um, need data to be captured in small spaces. This is where handheld scanners come to play. Using a handheld scanner, small spaces with high amounts of detail can be scanned in a dynamic fashion. Capturing data behind objects, underneath piping, uh, in between machinery are often difficult to use um, by a, a static tripod mounted scanner. With a handheld scanner, these features become much more accessible. So as we take a look here, um, this is a small boiler room or a section of it for that matter, where if we took a traditional um, tripod mounted scanner, we'd have to set up probably four, at least four spots over here to get, uh, you know, maybe 75% of the data needed. Um, that's because any scanner can only scan what's in line of sight of it. So if you set up a scanner over here, obviously it's not going to pick up the objects that are on the other side of an object um, or a structure. So um, using a hand scanner, we're able to go through and dynamically basically walk through the site with the scanner. And while it doesn't have the range, oops, doesn't have the range of a tripod mounted scanner, it can do small spaces very well. Being able to go through, find machinery that might need to be looked at, a have, have data at a closer perspective here, um, and, and really give insight that a, a static scanner might not be able to do. Now, oftentimes a project calls for out of the box thinking in order to capture the data necessary. Without going into the weeds on these technologies today, it's important to understand what is capable. Specialty vehicles are able to navigate unusual situations to capture key metrics, visual reference, and even 3D point clouds. Two quick examples seen here are the Hydron unmanned vehicle that can navigate a body of water and precisely capture key depth metrics using sonar and survey grade GPS. Alongside that, you'll see a custom confined space robot that were to built to navigate an underground storm sewer culvert in order to capture data and build an accurate point cloud for the purpose of modeling the interior and prefabricating drop in replacements. These situations are somewhat unusual, but the underlying theme here is when looking at a project, data can be captured in these one off environments that pose safety and logistical hurdles. So what's the, what, what capture method is best for the job? What is most efficient? What will yield the data needed without being excessive? When we look at a project, we typically determine the project goals and what needs to be achieved to get there. When data is needed to accomplish these goals, it's important to take a step back and understand how much data is necessary. For example, if you have an equipment room with 30 valves in a small space, the data per square foot that is necessary to capture or to be captured lends itself to scanning. On the other end of the spectrum, a pipeline where you have one piece of data every 50 feet lends itself to GPS surveying. So choosing the appropriate technology can greatly affect the efficiency in project of project design and the usefulness of as-built data. As-built plans can be developed from a scan point cloud. However, having a 360 <coughs> degree panoramic photos of the site can not only give an extra layer of data through high resolution imagery, but also gives the ability to share site details with colleagues without the need for transferring large amounts of spatial data. They'll be relying on powerful computers to process. Similarly, needing a pipeline right of way visual inspection may lend itself to, to only needing high definition video for condition assessments. 
While drone-generated point cloud might prove useful for terrain contours and, and measurements and dimensions, it's not always necessary in order to gather the data needed, uh, gather that data needed for that particular project. Data capture is a large part of modern day projects. Using advanced technology starts with assessing short and long-term goals for your data. Just as important is what you do with that data and how you manage it. With that being said, I'll turn it over to Brian to discuss the dynamics and key technology in data management. Thanks, Bruce. Everyone manages data. Now, we don't always think of Windows File Explorer as a data management platform, but it absolutely is. And a lot of times it really is the best tool for the job. The point clouds and visual data that Bruce just covered, we still manage a lot of that primarily by folder and file naming. When choosing what to do with all of your information, there's a continuum, right? Ranging from File Explorer, the simple, all the way up to relational databases. The big advantage to File Explorer is super high accessibility. Everyone who's ever used a computer can operate those tools. The downside is a low ceiling of capabilities. Most companies have something like this, a prescriptive manual for how to name things and where to put them. Conformance to those standards is left entirely up to the user, but it is easy. Viewing File Manager as a management platform, every file can be thought of as a single record with unlimited content, but one and only one data attribute, the file name. So we tend to cram different things in there, a client name, a project name, an idea of what's in the file, the date that it was generated. Because of that, the ability to search or aggregate data across different files and folders is extremely limited. All the way on the other end are databases. A database has many tables, each with rows and columns, a lot like a spreadsheet, but with no pretty formatting and strict rules about what can go into each cell. The downside of a database is extremely low accessibility. SQL isn't rocket science, but it's also not a natural skill set to all computer users like File Explorer is. The upside is a very high ceiling. Once you know how to use the tools, you can do pretty much anything you can imagine. Somewhere in the middle between those two is using Excel or a GIS to store information about files. And I'll note here that GIS systems typically use databases for storage. Um, we often see them used as flat files without taking advantage of the relational features that are built into the underlying system. In contrast, a normalized database stores each piece of information in only one place. It's typically a tree structure of many tables like what you're seeing here. It can be expensive to design because it needs to be done well. The structure is rigid, so it has to be thought out in advance. Uh, as an example of what I'm talking about, a flat file compared to a relational database, let's take a quick look at the utility pole attachments and design a flat GIS table. All right, so what do we see here? Well, we've, we've got a pole, and because this is a GIS, you know, we need the ID and the shape, but in between, Every pole has an owner, and the owner puts a, some sort of identifying tag on it, so we want to keep that. We might store the height, how beefy the pole is, they call it the class, and some information about the location. Then we're going to need to store some information about what's attached to it. Now, counting the power features and the telecom features here, I'm seeing seven attachments. This is a pretty clean pole. Let's design our system with space for 10 attachments to start with. So we've got 10 attachment columns. But as soon as we go to use our information, we might want to know which attachment is the highest or which is the lowest or what's the space between them. So that means that we're going to need to store the height of each attachment as a separate numerical column so that we can use math formulas. So now we have 20 columns for the attachers. Let's go ahead and make up some fake data for this Paul and a few of his friends and take a stab at using it. So here's a fun fact. If you're not from the utility poll space, uh, polls are owned by private companies and those companies charge rent to other companies who request permission to attach. So let's imagine that we're managing this data on behalf of this poll owner and our billing uh, department calls up and says, hey, it's time to send Shiloh their annual bill. How many attachments does Shiloh have in our system? All right, so it, it's not super straightforward, but we probably make some sort of count if formula that goes across all 10 attachment rows and gives us the number of Shiloh attachments in each row. And then we would sum down to get the total number of Shiloh attachments in the system. And that's when we realized that Shiloh has both telecom attachments that they should pay rent for and also street banners that should be handled differently. So that means we have to change our structure again to add a type for each attachment so that we can separate these banners out from the telecom attachments. So now we're up to 30 columns for the attachments. But our formula works. We can build Shiloh accurately 
And we can go along this way happily for a number of years until we expand our territory, we acquire somebody, and we take on this poll here. Another fun fact for the non-telecom portion of the crowd, attachments are counted per bolt. So when a cable turns a corner, that's two attachments, not one. So you can come back to this webinar site later and, and double check me, but I'm pretty sure I count 15 attachments plus a pop possible riser here. So that means that we're gonna have to modify our whole system. We should probably leave space for up to 20 attachments. So that means we're now up to 60 columns of attachments. You can't possibly read this on the screen, but the shape column is now all the way out in column BP. And the audience is probably divided into two groups, those saying this is a ridiculous example and those saying, yeah, that's pretty much our system. Uh, this is realistically close to a schema that I've worked with. And this story is almost done, except that imagine that five years later, someone in the auditing department feels like our billings are a little bit low. And when we dig into it, we realized that when we did that last expansion and added 10 more attachment slots, we didn't update our formula. So attachers 11 through 20 on every poll in the system have been getting free rent for years. And that's life living with a flat file in three minutes. The opposite of a flat file is normalizing your tables. A table is, again, just like a spreadsheet, but you wanna have a different sheet for every type of information. So we would have a table for polls. And the polls table is going to have information that just pertains to a particular poll. Now the poll has an owner, but we don't put information about a company in the polls table. We put it in a company's table and we get a single pointer from the polls table that says which row in the company's table is the owner of that poll. Likewise, we make a table of attachments with just the columns that deal with things that get attached to polls. Every attachment has a single pointer to tell us which row in the polls table is the owner of that attachment or is the poll that that attachment is attached to. Then we also have the owner and the types of companies that own attachments are the same types of companies that own polls. So this also has a pointer back to the company's table. And then we have this type of attachment. Uh, the National Electric Safety Code has rules for how things, how far apart things on polls have to be, and it's different based on type. So you need 40 inches for a secondary, 30 inches for a neutral, 12 inches for a communications cable. We might want to store that in our database. So let's make our types a table. We can put the NESC clearance that's required in there. And now we have a pointer instead of a static uh, value. Right. So then this is what our attachments table looks like. And what happens when you normalize your data is that things that were a whole bunch of columns turn into rows instead. So instead of having 60 columns to handle attachments, we have a large number of rows, but one column for every type of information. Okay. One of the things that this does for us is that the, the formulas become a lot easier. So the formula for counting how many attachments someone has in the system is just summing up all of the rows in this one table where the owner ID is the same. And that formula never needs updated. It doesn't need to change when we find a new worst case scenario. We're not, we're not changing our structure to add columns. This table just grows forever and that's fine. Analysis also becomes easier. Now that we stored that relationship between the NESC required spacing and we have the height of every attachment in the system in a single column, it's not too difficult to query which things are too close together and flag all the NESC violations in the system. That would be really difficult to do with that flat file that we looked at earlier. Now that's all great, it really is, it's very powerful, but don't miss that working with these tables by hand can be a pain, right? So if you imagine that you needed to put a new poll in your system, first you've got to look up what the ID is of the company that owns the poll, then you've got to insert a new row in the polls table using that ID. Then for everything that's attached to the poll, you have to look up the owner of the poll, the owner of the attachment, the ID of the type, and do that row after row after row. So you don't want to just dive into making a database. Uh, you really have to choose some sort of user-friendly interface or else everyone's going to quit. So the question is, when should you consider going to all of this considerable effort and expense? I like to look for places that have high volumes of similar information or anywhere that you're doing a similar thing over and over again. That's often a great opportunity. Uh, for us at RITU, that's been pipeline as well surveys. So I'm going to show you some of the ways um, that we're leveraging our database on the pipeline space. But I want to be clear first, I'm not pitching our system. I'm not saying that everyone has to do things the way that we're doing it. Uh, I'm saying that you should consider having a system that works for you. 
These are the internal tools that we created to solve specific problems that we had. So first up, here's what operating a database out of the box looks like. There's not much in the way of buttons. Honestly, it's pretty terrible to look at. Um, in the query editor, it's all about the data. There's no pretty pictures. This is one of our views. Views are queries uh, that you can use to combine information from lots of different tables into something readable, a lot like the flat file that we had a minute ago. A nice thing about the server-based database, though, is that everyone doesn't have to go through this interface. You can have multiple access points with, for a variety of different programs, and numerous users can use it simultaneously from different programs. So we use both an open source GIS called QGIS, as well as ArcGIS as user interfaces. And we're gonna look at another interface uh, next. Uh, this is our web app. And it's not because I'm saying everyone should build a web app, but this is a format that we can distribute to you. And that's the point internally as well. There's overhead involved in setting up new users with desktop GIS software. A web app is an interface that we can give out to our field surveyors, including subcontractors and temporary hires. Each user only sees what's shared with them. Uh, so after this presentation, you can come back to the site and log in as this demo user and, and poke around a little bit in some fake projects that I set up. I'm only gonna touch on a, a couple of things. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about the construction progress and I'm just gonna jump straight to the map view. But over here, if you wanna check it out later, is the, the entry form that we give to our field surveyors to enter the information, as well as the form that our supervisors use to authorize and approve that information. And what the database does is let's say that some ditching was done and the, the field crew recorded that from station 42 to 45, um, ditching was done on this day. The database automatically takes the design alignment, trims it to that start and end station and offsets each type of quantity by a different amount so that we can see them all together. So you can come in here and at a glance, see the status of a project. How much is still left to be backfilled? Uh, has any ditching been done at all? This has been a, a great tool for us. And if we hide that, we can see the as-built information. And if I click on one of the, the pipes here, what you're seeing is the same information that was in that ugly query editor a minute ago is just presented on a map, just like with any GIS software. And I want to talk about this MTR link or um, material test report. If you're not from the pipeline space, a material test report is a document that's provided with every piece of steel pipeline part and it, it says things about how strong the pipe is, and it includes a heat number. This number is also stamped onto every pipe. It's important that uh, companies keep these MTRs with the records for the pipeline so that auditors can review them later. Now, we didn't set out to build a pipeline MTR management system. That's not what we do. Uh, we just need to record the heat number for each part that we survey. The problem we were trying to solve was how do we quality check our own entry? Now, how can we be sure that when someone types in a number out in the field, that they've got the right number that's actually stamped on the pipe and they're not fat fingering anything? Well, once we had already decided to build a database for our, our data in general, once we already decided the pipe tally was gonna go in the database and our locational information was there, we said, well, what happens if we put the MTR information in the database? And I wonder if the, the client would give us all their MTRs and let us put them in there. Um, one of the superpowers of a database is very fast search. So that's what we do now. We enter in all MTRs for a project up front, and then as we import survey information, the database automatically links pipes to the correct MTR if there's a match, both on heat number and material specs, and it throws an error flag if not. That accomplished our first goal, catching field mistakes before the pipe is buried. What you find happening when you normalize and centralize your data like this is that over time you find new ways to use that information. So what happened next is someone said, hey, uh, I need to know if we already have an MTR for this particular heat number, but I don't know what pipe it goes to. I don't know what to click on. How can I look that up? Well, since it was already in a table, it wasn't too difficult to build a, a search page here. And we were able to do some things to make it look not just for literal matches, but for partial matches like this one um, or transpositions. And it gives a score of how similar the result is. And from here, you can launch the PDF. So this has been really useful as well. And then later on, um, our MTR error check came up with a client. We were talking about how we, how we, the same thing I just talked to you about, how we link every pipe to a PDF. And they said, well, hang on a second. You're saying you have a PDF of every MTR linked to every pipe. 
at the end of the project, can you make an index of them, sort of like a phone book for all the MTRs in that project? And so we did. It's not in the web app here, but in our desktop GIS tools. Whenever a pipeline is completed, we click a button and the program looks through all the MTR files that are referenced by all of the parts in that project, downloads each individual PDF, combines it all into a single big PDF, and then prepends the whole thing with an index that lists every heat number alphabetically, along with what page in the final PDF it's on. It really didn't take very long to throw that together because of how we're using the relational tables. And then I guess one last example of, of an unexpected way that things were used and was useful was that a client caught a manufacturer cheating on an MTR report. Um, after some investigation, they decided that they really did have to go replace all of the elbows with that particular heat number. So if you look at the bends here, you can imagine there's a lot of elbows in the system. And there was some concern about how they would find them all. Uh, they didn't even know what projects they'd been used on. But since all of the pipes in our projects are in the same table, just like that attachments table in that example earlier, we found them spread across five different projects and were able to send a KML with the location of each one within the hour. And the contractor was able to start digging right away. Uh, also over here is our field file uploader. That's a, that's a new initiative. One of our recent issues was a, a newer field crew struggling to remember send all of their field files in. And this is our idea to help them out. We could spend a lot more time talking about the advantages that come over time as you use the database well, but I do wanna make sure that we leave enough time for questions. So, you know, what's my, what's my closing advice? I wish that I could tell you a definitive answer. I wish I could say, go buy the Fluferhoven system and all your problems will be solved. Uh, but there is no such thing. So on the one hand, don't discount the value of simplicity. Let's take point clouds, for example. They're huge. They would have destroyed our file server. So we got a bigger disk on a different system. Uh, gee, thanks, I know, right? Ritu just said, buy a bigger disk. Uh, but, but seriously, we could have made a database to organize our point clouds, but why? They're just raw positions. There are a lot of raw positions, but they're just raw positions. Now, some of the measurements that we extract from a point cloud, you know, once we attach identity to them, once we say this is a particular valve or this is a, a unit and this is its number, then sure, we'll put that into a database. But the clouds themselves, leave them in File Explorer. But don't ignore geodatabases either. I'd encourage you to skip over that middle ground. If you find yourself making a spreadsheet with file names and folder locations, so that you can search or track something better, that's likely an indicator that a database could help you. Once you've decided on that, there are many ways to implement a database-backed approach, ranging from off-the-shelf interfaces to coming up with your own. What I suggest is building your team first, invest in your people, and then invest some real time talking about all your information and make a plan that works for your team. As an example, 10 years ago, I was on the losing side of a debate. Uh, let's call him Steve. Steve wanted to use Google Earth to collect field data. I wanted to use QGIS. We went with Google Earth, but within a year, we all decided to switch over to QGIS. And I must have said something arrogant because I remember my boss saying, you know, it's not true that you were right and Steve was wrong. If we'd have started with QGIS a year ago, it would have failed. It became the right solution because you made it be the right solution. But in the meantime, we had a year of success with Google Earth. Now, the new system is undeniably better than the old, but that doesn't mean that the old was a waste, it was a necessary step. And the, the, the funny thing is, I hadn't thought about this in a decade and I really didn't get it until I was working on this webinar. Uh, but he was right. If your team is excited about an idea, it will become the right idea because they'll spend the energy to overcome any issues. And a begrudged system will fail despite any advantages that it might have. And I'm not just talking about relational data. When evaluating scanning or drones like Bruce talked about compared to traditional measurements, Make sure that you include your data team in the decision, whether that's CAD drafters or your GIS team. If they can't get comfortable using point clouds, that could easily undermine all of the savings that you get from faster data collection in the field. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to BJ, who's been monitoring the questions and will handle the Q&A. So thanks. Thanks, Brian. So uh, as you can see, we're uh... We're in a different world here. Um, survey is not uh, two guys in a truck um, going out and, and picking up points uh, manually. Um, New Frontier is here and these guys uh, uh, hopefully answered a lot of the questions. Now, um, 
I've been monitoring the questions. I have a couple here that um, I'll uh, pitch out to the guys. Um, so easy one to start with. Uh, what are the stated accuracies that can be achieved by using a drone? Yeah, so BJ, I'll take that one. Um, so it, the, the easiest answer is, is I guess it, it depends, um, but the official answer is around one to three inches. Um, depending on the environment. So this is assuming that we're talking about drone point clouds. So what uh, what's typical and, and common um, practices, as I mentioned earlier, using control points, ground control points. Uh, in this case, often we use bucket lids, so it's easy to be able to be seen from a high altitude with the drone. Um, and having survey GPS on those bucket lids or those control points um, to be able to help pull together the the accuracy of the site and the point cloud in there um, so typically we'll we'll see an overall accuracy of around one to three inches very good um, and this one i think bruce will probably be up your alley um, question is uh, what options are out there um, to make ex to make accessing point clouds and large files easier. For example, being able to view and or share a scan deliverable um, of a large compressor station. So that's that's a really good question. Um, and it's one that actually comes up quite often. So um, the world that we live in right now, data is, is very large, um, especially with point clouds in particular. Um, you know, it's, it's just inevitable. The amount of data points that are taken um, you know, as, as I was saying earlier, it can be you know, upwards of, of, you know, billions of points. So the files are inherently going to be large. The point clouds after being processed and, and stitched together are large. Um, so typically anything, um, you know, anything that we, we process, we have to look at how are we going to compress it. Um, it, it actually, to take a step back, um, what, what's the best way to get this data to the client? Are they comfortable with downloading from a secure link? Um, are they more comfortable with having a hard drive shipped out to them? Um, or, you know, or something to that effect. So first we establish that, um, you know, what the, what the preferred method is. If, um, if they are comfortable with downloading from a secure link, then we can take a look at, at compression um, methods in, in terms of getting that data down as small as possible. And there are multiple levels of that, um, you know, including super high compression that will strip some of the features out um, of the point cloud, but make it extremely small. Um, but, you know, it, it just depends on what's needed. Um, and it kind of goes with the, the theme of today of, of taking a look at what what your parameters are, what your needs are, and then adjusting based around that. So, um, like I said, uh, sending it through secure links, sending it through hard drives are, are the two most, um, the most common ways of sending out data. Um, but, you know, we're always looking for more, more ways. Oh, it's, it's also very important to, um, to, to mention that there are, um, you know, panoramics, there are some point clouds that we can um, publish through a web app um, so that it is able to be viewed at the very least, um, you know, through that web app and, and, and interactively from anywhere that there's internet through, you know, whether it be a, a mobile device or a computer or whatnot, um, as we see, uh, saw here today, especially the drone um, flight that I, sh I showed earlier, um, that is specifically through a web app where we would host the data or host it somewhere and then um, it would be able to be viewed um, by the, the client. Awesome. Yeah, that that uh, that should answer that question. I do have uh, I have a, a third and actually I just got another one here. Um, so Brian, um, there's a question here. If I wanted to create uh, a web app to allow a project team to access and view information, would I have the ability to limit the types of data that can be certain that can be seen by certain individuals? Gotcha. Um, so web apps are really broad because there's a lot of different ways to make them. So, so two answers. With off-the-shelf solutions, your options are a little bit limited. Um, so like ArcGIS lets you publish uh, web apps and does a really good job at it. But typically you have to 
you have to go in and manually publish a project, and then you can give permission to different people. We're, we're doing it a different way. When you run your own web app, you can do whatever you want. So the web app that you're looking at for us, um, we have a whole table, of, a whole system of tables for permissions. And when you log in, you're logging in as a particular person and functions that we wrote go into the database and go get all of the things, all the pipes, all the wells, everything that you're allowed to see. So yes, if you roll your own, you can. And when we work with clients, you know, clients can come in and see the, the status of their progress of their survey projects without seeing anyone else's. And it's automated. We don't have to publish a new site for every project that we do, um, but it requires a bit of work. It, it, it's it's not super simple. So your, your options are a little bit limited if you're looking off the shelf. Thanks, Brian. And uh, and I think this this last question, um, at least for now, um, is for Bruce. So do scanning technologies use facial or pattern recognition to improve tie in of data points and to increase scanning efficiency? I guess it could be either one of you guys. No, that's that's a that's a really great question. So the scanning technologies, I mean, scanning scanner technologies are are increasing and, and growing um, really quickly right now. It's really a great time for, for this equipment and this technology. Um, now I'll, I'll kind of give a two part answer to this in terms of scanner technologies. Um, there are scanners out there that have technologies in terms of um, monitoring from station to station and setup to setup, uh, monitoring the the pixels in between them and finding um, finding common points as you're literally picking up the scanner to move it to the next site. Um, it will track those common um, points of, of view and be able to understand where it is in relation to that. So it's pretty pretty cool technology right now. Now, in terms of of pattern recognition to tie in data points together, that kind of explains some of it. But in terms of the post processing software, um, in conjunction with um, you know the act of scanning, there um, we use things like um, like spheres, like a uh, um, specific to scanning, where there the the software will pick those up automatically and have that pattern recognition knowing that those are specific to a certain size or whatnot um, that are industry standards and it will understand that those are particular control points that you can use um, to spatially stitch together multiple scans so if we have scan one over here one scan over here or scan two over here and we have um, a couple of those orbs sprinkled around where both of those scans see those orbs um, it will be able to recognize um, those as control points and where they are spatially within those scans and use them as common points to tie them together to create a much larger scan world. And I hope that answers your question. All right, thanks, Bruce. Um, I don't see any other questions out there. Um, so at this time, uh, I wanna thank you all for attending the, the, the webinar. Again, as a reminder, um, if you need PDH credits and you did not put it in your RSVP, uh, reach out to Victoria Webb or on the screen right now, you've got uh, Bruce and Brian's contact information. I'm sure they would uh, field, uh, field that request as well as any other questions that you have regarding um, you know, survey technologies, uh, anything that we spoke about today. Uh, I wish you all uh, good health and uh, thanks for attending. Have a great week.